And so I've tentatively called this one the Three Kings, Odin, Varuna, and Zeus. Not in any particular order, by the way. And I thought this title would be interesting because each of these mythological characters are referred to as a sovereign. This particular trait is part of the unique characteristic of each god. This project started initially as an investigation into the Skyfather concept, the Proto-Indo-European Skyfather idea. And so I was researching this idea, which proposes a common linguistic root underlying most of the European languages, and also the languages of Iran and India. And so I guess why this is of interest, to me at least, as an independent researcher, is because it shows some kind of commonality between peoples. Not, not commonality for its own sake though, but to see how the different religions are related. More to the point, have we all been basically worshipping the same gods throughout history, with different names, different appearances, and so on. So I guess I was a little bit attracted to this kind of idea. Specifically the linguistic root Dewas, which apparently translates as something like God. Actually, I think it's Dewas that comes from the root Dew. The root Dew means sky or heaven. So I believe the word for God comes from sky or heaven. And the other word, the other root that comes from sky is Dius or Dius Pater, the sky father. Of course, I mentioned some of that in the recent video on Zeus and Zeus or Jupiter will be uh, coming up again in this recording. But pretty early on, my research took me in a bit of a different direction. So this video is not about me presenting a fully fledged sky father theory. That's not really where I'm going with this video, but that's how the project began. I was led to different gods that had similar characteristics, not based in a common linguistic root, but based on how these seemingly different characters have very much the same functions, the same roles, the same uh, epithets. And of course there is a cross-cultural similarity. I'm looking at Woden, which is a Germanic invention. Likewise, Zeus is a Greek invention, Jupiter, a Roman invention. Similar pagan belief systems between these peoples. So I'll get on with the video now. This is not a social, political or historical video. Okay, so let's begin with Varuna, the Vedic sovereign. Cosmic sovereign, that is. Now, Varuna is one of those peculiar deities. The term deity, by the way, also goes back to the root for sky or heaven. He's peculiar in the sense that for the supposed main Vedic god, he is not very obvious or well represented. So you wouldn't think that he was very important or high in the ranks. You mainly hear about Indra. Indra is the deity that takes center stage in the Vedic pantheon. Later, of course, with the development of Hinduism, it just becomes all about Vishnu, but I'm not really going into that here. You look at images of Varuna and it's a little man sitting on a crocodile holding a rope. He doesn't seem like a big deal, but appearances can be deceiving and they usually are. With the advent of Hinduism, certain Vedic gods stopped being worshipped and some of them were worshipped less or in a different way. And so regarding Varuna, he was changed into a deity of the ocean, which was a significant fall from grace. So if he is even still in the Hindu consciousness, he is a mere god of the ocean, a bit like Poseidon or Neptune. Now there's some scholarly confusion about the origin of Varuna's name. Most resources that you will read, websites, books and so on, derive his name from a root meaning 
covering or to cover. So I think these probably Western-centric scholars thought of Varuna as like the sky or as being the sky because the sky can be sort of seen to cover the earth. We can imagine the sky dome or the sky sphere holding the earth disk and that is an ancient world view but after having looked into this myself it doesn't seem like the right origin the right linguistic origin for the name Varuna. I trust more the research of R. N. Dandekar who says that Varuna's name probably comes from the root to bind thus Varuna is the binder the one who binds this would make sense because in all of the paintings and statues of him he carries a noose the pasha so part of his unique function would be to tie something or constrain something with the rope or to hold something down to keep something together this is what we use a rope for now etymology and linguistic roots is one thing we can't rely completely on this of course we also need to look at how the character is represented in the Vedas specifically the Rig Veda I uh, use mostly for a reference most of the hymns in the Rig Veda that mention Varuna talk about him in talk about him as the mechanics of all that is visible let me read a quote from a book this is not directly from the Rig Veda but it seems to be a rewriting of something that was in the Veda so he it is who makes the sun to shine in the heavens. The winds that blow are but his breath. He has hollowed out the channels of the rivers, which flow at his command, and he has made the depths of the sea. So it's saying that whatever we experience externally with our senses, the mechanics of how that works is due to him. He is operating invisibly behind that, making the sun, moon, and planets move, compelling the course of life on earth. The word command here is important. This is because his name is also related to speech and giving commands and orders. So his ordinances are fixed and unassailable. An ordinance is an authoritative order but also relates to laws, rules. Like I said, the mechanics, the way things work. His ordinances are fixed and unassailable through their operation the moon walks in brightness and the stars which appear in the nightly sky vanish in daylight the birds flying in the air the rivers in their sleepless flow cannot attain a knowledge of his power and wrath in the hymns of the Rig Veda this is also something that you notice about him the way he's often described is ra like wrathful or scary in some kind of way we'll get onto that but he knows the flight of the birds in the sky, the course of the far traveling wind, the paths of ships on the ocean, and beholds all the secret things that have been or shall be done. He witnesses men's truth and falsehood. So he's resp it's saying that he's responsible for the way things work externally, but also how things work internally for all beings. From him are the laws of existence. So, the law of cause and effect, which operates both externally and internally. So you can begin to see now maybe how that relates to his name, the way he is written about as a lawgiver, or that being his specific domain. It relates to binding, because we are all bound with, with that law, with those laws. A law by definition is something that you have to abide by or it seems like something that is not able to be changed therefore the only option is to work within that so Varuna is setting the rules he's creating the system he's creating the structure he's organizing how things will pan out if you do this action or that action there will be a particular result so Varuna binds the bodies of all beings and the consciousnesses of all beings with this law and one can only assume that is what makes him a king that is what makes him a sovereign an authority a ruler a governor whatever word you want to use 
And so apparently in the Vedic times, Varuna was the main deity, along with Mitra, the god Mitra, and the other Adityas and Aditi. So it was more like a group of deities. Mitra is interesting because Mitra, the name Mitra, also goes back to a root meaning uh, binding or to bind. But Mitra doesn't have the power that Varuna has. Mitra deals with the more mundane aspect of law, more mundane social, political, so uh, contracts, agreements, alliances, and also friendships, bonds, any kind of um, earthly social bond, I guess you could say, is Mitra's domain. And Varuna and Mitra are often, most often, talked about as one deity, as a, as a pair. Mitra is not spoken about as separate from Varuna very much in the Vedas. And so Mitra is an Aditya. Varuna is the first of the Adityas, the chief of the Adityas. As I've talked about in previous videos, the meaning of the word Aditya is something like infinite or boundless. So these are infinite and immortal influences that come from Aditi who is the same, Aditi means the same, it's boundless, um, it, immutable, immortal, infinite, and she's the mother of all of those specific immortal influences. And so these Adityas were born to sustain and preserve the creation, sustain and preserve existence, ultimately for the purpose of each being's liberation. But the the general idea of what you the general idea you want to get is the infinite creates the the finite. So the chief of these infinite influences is said to be have been Varuna, which makes Varuna the creator and the maintainer of all that there is. And so he creates all that there is through law, through his rope, through his noose, the pasha, and also maintains everything in existence through that very same rope, through that very same noose. Varuna is the absolute order, you would say. So all created beings have no choice but to exist within that law that he makes. But within that law, they have a choice of action. This is why it talks about Varuna witnessing men's truth and falsehood. Varuna needs to know what people are doing so he can give those people a the correct result for what they did. There's a reference to his spies in this regard. So I'm reading from the book. His spies descending from the skies glide all this world around. Their thousand eyes all scanning sweep to earth's remotest bound. Whatever exists in heaven and earth, whatever beyond the skies, before the eye of Varuna the thing unfolded lies. The secret winkings all he counts of every mortal's eyes and wields this universal frame as Gamester throws his dice. So that's an author's poetic license from uh, inspired by a passage from the Rig Veda. And apparently the sun is also alluded to as the eye of Varuna but also of Mitra as well. Through the sun, they can see all that's going on. It also references quite a lot in the Veda. The Rig Veda also has many hymns regarding Varuna, where it talks about sin and punishment. So I'll read this, um, and this is a direct verse from the Rig Veda. Be gracious, O mighty God, be gracious. I have sinned through want of power. Seeking to perceive that sin, O Varuna, I inquire. I resort to the wise to ask. The sages all tell me the same. It is Varuna who is angry with thee. What great sin is it, Varuna, for which thou seekest to slay thy worshipper and friend? Tell me, O unassailable and self-dependent God. And freed from sin, I shall speedily come to thee for adoration. Release us from the sins of our fathers and from those which we have committed in our own persons. It was not our will, Varuna, but some seduction which led us astray. Wine, anger, dice, or thoughtlessness. So, 
I guess this is kind of like repenting. I'm not sure about the magical nature of those prayers, whether they were effective. It's something to look into more deeply. I don't have the scope for it in this video, but hopefully you can see how Varuna has the commanding and authoritative presence that he does or that he had. And it would make sense that he would be conceived therefore as a cosmic emperor. It's worth mentioning also Varuna's epithet or title as the Asura. An Asura originally meant someone or something that has power. So Varuna is king. He's a sovereign because he has the power of law with which to create existence. He was considered to be a hidden and powerful presence, like a magician. Okay, so now on to Odin of the Norse pantheon, the high god of Scandinavia, Germany, and all of Northern Europe. Odin is also referred to as a sovereign and as a king. And from what I've read, it seems that in Scandinavian and Germanic society, different gods would appeal to the different classes or stratas of that society. Thor was worshipped by farmers and probably soldiers as well. Farming and fighting, they're very Thor-type things. Thor emphasises productivity and courage and they say that Odin appealed to the, I guess you could say, upper class nobles. These people, I guess, had time to think and probably included priests, sorcerers, magicians, all the mystical stuff, but also the political and strategical side of things. That was the province of Odin. There's a similar correlation to the Vedic people. At the top of their pyramid, they would have the Brahmins, that is the learned ones, the people who knew things, the educated class, then the Kshatriyas or warriors, then the Vaishyas or business people, the economic class, and finally the Shudras or menial workers. So Odin's name, it is apparently related to the word for frenzy. The dictionary says that frenzy means a state or period of uncontrolled excitement or wild behavior. Similar words are hysteria, madness, insanity, delirium, euphoria, ecstasy. So Odin is the lord of that. He rules that. Now, I think what his name is referring to is altered states of consciousness brought about by specific rituals. Odin is very much like a shaman. So we had Varuna who was the magician king and Odin is the shaman king. So it brings to mind shamans doing magical dances accompanied by intense drumming. It's all energy and excitement that is being generated to release the individual's consciousness from the mundane reality and to change it and transport it to somewhere else. The point is, I guess, that the shaman has to become so fluid in his character in order to be able to assume the form that he desires. Now, it's interesting to consider the Sami people, indigenous people of Scandinavia, because these people practiced shamanism and the deities they worship were similar to the Vikings. As an example, one of them is called Horagalas, who was their god of thunder. And Horagalas means Thor man. They also had a god called Radien, who was their head divinity and their creator god. Radien, Odin, sounds kind of similar. So I guess if you had a good shaman, and they knew what they were doing. They could alter their state of consciousness to pass into the future and to thus foretell the future in some kind of way. So there's probably a divinatory purpose to that, among other purposes like healing. So how does Odin's name relate to his character in the mythologies? 
in the stories. Well, remember that Odin is the creator of Midgard and the nine Norse worlds. How does he create Midgard or the middle garden or the earth? He creates it from the deceased carcass of Ymir, the giant, his flesh, his blood, his bones. So the story says, this is akin to light emanating from darkness. It even says that Odin and his brothers are the spiritual essence that brings order to the chaotic reality of the giants. So think about that strong, inextricable relationship between light and dark and how light is born from the dark. So this story is about the birth of awareness, but also the birth of knowledge. The darkness is all that is to be known, all that can be known. And Odin wants that knowledge. That's really his defining characteristic. He has a great thirst and lust for knowledge. But knowledge for what? What does he want to do with that knowledge? Why does he want to know things? Well, it's knowledge for creation. Firstly, he has to know how to create Midgard and how to create the human beings, how to create the other Norse worlds, the other beings as well, and also the other gods, uh, the other Aesir and the Vanir who live in Asgard. All of that has to be known. And so he's very reliant on darkness. He's very reliant on the giants. And this is made known through the stories because you've got all sorts of bloodline lineages between the Aesir and the giants as well. So Odin creates Yggdrasil, the tree of life, and the branches of this tree support the various domains, the homes of various beings. So like I said, the humans in Midgard, you've got the realm of the dwarfs and the realm of the elves and so on. And so it's suggested that it's it suggested that, that through this tree, he sustains the lives of the lives of all of the beings in all of the worlds. And the tree itself is sustained by the three Norns, three female divinities who sprinkle water on the tree every day, on the roots of the tree. And the three Norns weave the fates of humans and all of the beings. They represent the, or they are the law and order that govern Odin's existence, his creation. So effectively, Odin sets them up, he sets the three Norns up to weave the destiny of not only the external existence, but the internal lives of humans and all the other beings. So the moral system, if you will, is if you're good, you go to Valhalla. If you're bad, you go to hell, literally hell. That is the name of the goddess that lives in Niflheim. So you see this ordered system and this system of merit that the creator maintainer god sets up and operates. And Odin doesn't just create it and just leave it be. He's intimately involved in his own creation. He sits on his throne, the Hlitskjalf, not sure if I pronounced that correctly, but he sits on his throne in Asgard and he sends his two crows out, Hugin and Munin, to observe what is happening in Midgard and the other worlds. See how similar it is to Varuna who sends out his spies to find out what's happening. Odin wants to know what's what, probably so he can administer the fate of each being, but it doesn't really mention that in the stories. I'm just connecting the dots here. Hugin and Munin mean thought and memory. Each, so one of the crows is called thought and one of them is called memory. So he retains a memory of everything that's going on. He has a thirst for knowledge. First, knowledge to create. Second, knowledge to maintain, to maintain the order that he set up. So he needs that insight and that wisdom. And it's not, he doesn't just send the crows out. He actually incarnates into his own creation in a lot of the stories. So he observes his own creation by becoming a created form. Remember, he's a cosmic shapeshifter. He can become anything that he 
desires, anything that he wills. Here's an interesting quote from a book. From the hall of heaven he rode away to Litzkialf and sat upon his throne, the mount from whence his eye surveys the world. And far from heaven he turned his shining orbs to look on Midgard, the earth and men. So it's implying that the sun and the moon are Odin's eyes, just like Varuna. Of course, in one of the stories, Odin sacrifices his eye, gives it to Mimir in exchange for a drink from his well. And Mimir places his eye deep inside that well. And so Odin is left with a single eye, which can be said to be symbolic for the sun. And the other eye that's inside the well is the watery, diluted, fady, faded eye, a little bit like the moon, a less bright version of the moon. Okay, so now on to Jupiter or Zeus. So I had quite a bit of trouble with this one, actually. I ummed and ahed about whether Jupiter really did correspond to Odin and Varuna. I know that Odin and Varuna are very similar, and so I already had, I had a special feeling about them. But at first I couldn't quite see how Zeus was like them. I actually began with Uranus. Uranus was the Greek god that I thought best fitted. And this was partly because, well, mostly because I assumed that the name Varuna came from uh, a root syllable meaning uh, covering or to cover. So I initially saw Varuna as the sky sphere, the sky dome that covers the earth disk, which is what Uranus is described as, the starry heaven in Hesiod's Theogony, the sky that covers Terra or Gaia. And I still associated these two gods, Varuna and Uranus, even though I knew that the name Uranus probably cannot be said to, to come from the same etymological origin as Varuna. Well, it can't. I mean, it isn't. Uh, Uranus comes from a different root. It seems to come from a word meaning to rain or to pour down. But even so, I still saw these two gods as like sky gods worthy of comparison. But the more I thought about it and the more I researched Varuna and, and thought about how rich Odin's character and story is, it no longer made sense to associate Uranus because there's hardly any material on Uranus. There's hardly any stories or any art. So he doesn't seem like a major god or a major character. Or maybe he once was but not any longer. So that's why I couldn't really work with Uranus, the Uranus idea. But what was interesting was this relationship between Uranus and, and Zeus, the fact that they both mean the sky. Where does rain come from? The sky. He's called the heaven or the sky in the mythological record. And what's the root of Zeus's name? It goes back to the root Dew, meaning sky. So if I use Zeus, I'm not losing anything. Zeus inherits the characteristics of his grandfather Uranus. And there's a lot more material on Zeus. Zeus is like a king character. He has a similar historical popularity and standing comparable with Odin and Varuna. The name Zeus, as I've talked about in my other videos translates as something like the daylit sky in contrast to the night sky represented by the goddess Nyx whom Zeus holds in the palm of his hand. Daylight is symbolic of good. Nighttime is symbolic of evil. Daytime is symbolic of order. Nighttime is symbolic of disorder or chaos. Daytime is symbolic of manifestation. Nighttime is symbolic of destruction or the creative energies changing and withdrawing. Daytime is symbolic of purity. Nighttime is symbolic of impurity or 
dirtiness, filthiness. Daytime is symbolic of honesty, truth. Nighttime is symbolic of dishonesty and lying and deceit, but also secrecy. Daytime is symbolic of openness. And the two rely completely on each other. Zeus can only be Zeus with Nyx, just like day can only be day with night. So I see this as a spiritual allegory. I'm not necessarily saying that the ancient Greeks and Romans saw it exactly like that, because I don't have that evidence. But I imagine that it's, that it's something like this. From my research and my thinking, Zeus is king of gods and men. He brings consciousness to the universe, and through conscious awareness, we develop principles. We develop a sense of what's right and wrong, morals, a sense of justice, but also philosophy, a religious life. We develop all of the fields of research, including scientific research, all types of learning, education, all types of culture, art, values, value systems, and these then get materialized. We build institutions called churches, governments, schools, universities. And so what's all of that order based upon? The darkness of our mind, the fear, the ignorance, the not knowing. But like I was talking about with Odin, the light is born from the darkness. So I see Jupiter as the inherent tendency towards what is purposeful, meaningful in life. And that creates order in the experience that creates order on the earth. But because of this very, um, if you think about Zeus, Jupiter in the way that I'm talking about here, it's a dichotomy, right? So you've got to be very careful with that. You've got to know, like the definition of like order and chaos and like good and evil has got to be spot on. Otherwise you'll create an imbalance. What I mean is that the definition of good and evil would have to be absolute. Anyway, I thought that would be an interesting subject material. So I hope that was enjoyable. And like my other videos, it's, it's a resource for your own inner work.